in a hall of mirrors, by the main, you can actually lure demons in a trap. Maybe that's what the shining is really about with the maze. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, it's like, because if the being, because no matter which way the being would look, it would see a reflection. You know, mirrors are used in torsion technology oh, yeah. where they yeah. make things. So a mirror is a torsion technology device. Actually, it is. And, and it's a, when you curve it like this, it'll make the, uh, you know, you know, they had the two different, one thing was rotting and it made this grow faster. So, yeah. So that, that would be one way. That's a crazy idea. Hey, everybody. Jay Widener, Reality Check. Thanks for watching. We are back. We're talking about all sorts of weird stuff um, with Ken from C60 fame, Purple Power. And um, uh, you ever read this book? It's called uh, The Magic of Mirrors. It's, a real, it's by a physicist. It's a really good book. Um, I have it somewhere. Um, very rare book, but it talks all about mirrors and how, how they can kind of transpose reality and pass through other dimensions and and then there's all the myths about mirrors and yeah. oh, uh, like the scrolling mirror, the dark mirror, mm -hmm. where people could see. That's what Nostradamus would look at. He'd have a scrolling mirror. Mm -hmm. He would look, and he could see the future. That's what, I was like. what was that? The scrolling mirror. I mean, physically, what did that look like? It's just a round thing, a silver edge, and then he would um, he would frequently uh, put it at the bottom of a bowl of water, and then he would look into the mirror and and take an uh, uh, instrument and, and make the water flow. And that would put him into a state where he would start seeing the future. Oh, well, that's, I guess other people out there could do that too. Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, like a lot of people do it. It's a, it's a, um, it's a uh, scrying, it's called, scrying. And it's an ancient method for divination. And he, that's what he was, and he was a, um, I I spent a night at Nostradamus's house, by the way. Um, it was now a and b, &B and um, I I got the room with my wife, and there was about three hundred cats in the place, and all of Nostradamus's stuff was still there, oh. like the clock and all the stuff that had been there. How long ago was that? This is ninety nine, and. Um, and I saw we went to bed. It was a really magical place. We, we we had a fantastic French dinner, and then we went to bed. And about two in the morning, I woke up, and it sounded like there was like forty or fifty people in the house, but like a party was going on. So I got what's I figured out what's going on here. So I opened up my uh, door of my B and B, and there was nobody there. It was completely dark and black. And well, then I closed the door, and I could hear the sounds again. So I still don't know what, <laughs> but what is that? I don't know what it was. The unexplainable. Yeah. So you knew um, what's his name, the James Trevor Constable. Yeah, Trevor James Constable. Yeah, he yeah. was. Uh, I knew him when he lived in San Pedro, right there near Long Beach and yeah. Palos Verdes Estates. Yeah, yeah. He was up on like the promontory. <laughs> yeah, he moved here from New Zealand. Yes, and I think he. Uh, yeah, he became. Uh, I think he was getting World War II, and eventually became a radio officer and a freighter, the Maui. Yeah, and he used to for uh, radar. Artillery, yeah, radar. Yeah, and he'd go back and forth from uh, Long Beach to Honolulu Yeah, for, you know, I don't know how many years. Yeah, and it would detect all these things flying around and mm -hmm. in the skies. And, yes. and of course, the, that whole area is a strange area. That whole uh, California, you have that base under Malibu. And, of course, they had, what's his name on, the doctor, who filmed all the UAPs flying Oh, yeah. Around. Yep, they have they, yeah, so many of those films. There's a lot of different, you know, things. I like to see stuff all the time. And there's so many people with phones there, you know, yeah. with camera phones that it gets, it gets posted. Yeah, yeah, which is another question. But anyway, let's get back to Constable. So he saw these things in the sky and found, uh, did infrared photography, and he caught him, he called him a sky critter. Yes, and, and, and you couldn't see him in visible light. Yeah. You'd have to do it in infrared, and they're translucent. Yeah. So that's, that's the key, like these translucent... And there's a whole variety of them. It's like a whole zoo of these translucent beings that live in the infrared. Yeah, and then the, uh, I think it was Cliff High was talking about they invented something during the Vietnam War to allow the gunners to be able to see at night. You yeah, know? it was the red one. Though. The red one. It was a red in the red scale. And that they saw terrifying things that they were shooting at them. And, and uh, they finally had to get rid of the goggles because they, they were just... Well, they were seeing into another dimension that maybe exists parallel to us. Yeah. So um, what people don't realize is that 
is that the quest to see into other dimensions is a primary quest of the intelligence agencies. Yeah, well, it's, it's exploration. Yeah. yeah. I mean, knowing what's going on the other side yeah. would seem logical to me. Yeah, and that's where, and that's why the um, psychedelics actually, although they, Wasson, the banker, he discovered mushrooms and he didn't discover them. He found them from the Mexican. Oh, yes, yeah, so the culture say, translated. Yeah, you can't say he discovered them. Well, but he brought them back in the 50s and immediately the intelligence agencies became extremely interested in all this. So remember that other, that red and white uh, uh, mushroom up in the... Yeah, the Amanita, Amanita, Amanita muscaria. Yes, yeah, so where they, uh, they feed, I guess they feed it to the, uh, they dry it, feed it the reindeer and then drink the urine. Drink and the reindeer. Because use the, I guess use the reindeer's kidney as the... Yeah, the uh, kidney passes all yeah, the so, toxins out of it. Not so that I'm advocating that, by the way. No. Drinking reindeer, yeah, urine probably, maybe not the best thing for you. There's a great uh, uh, a researcher, I believe he's not around any longer, and he, he, his, his whole idea was that in the Scandinavian countries, that which is where the Amanita muscaria was found, was that the um, Santa Claus was a, a human representation of the Amanita muscaria, was red and white, and 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 round, and that he, what would happen is the snow. They had log cabins in the old days. The snow would go all the way up and cover all the way to the roof of the cabin. And the only way out of the cabin was through the chimney in oh. the middle of the Oh, yeah, that would make sense if you've got a big snowstorm. Yeah. That's... And so uh, the shaman would dress up like the Amanita muscaria at the solstice uh, uh, the day that the sun comes back, which is the 25th, and drop the Amanita muscaria it through the chimney. Oh, down the chimney. So, oh, so he would probably he would collect it during the summertime. Yeah. And then he would come by and, dry the summer, it and he would drop off mushrooms yeah. to everybody in like the village. Yeah. And then that's sort of sad. That's a really good shaman. I'd yeah. definitely bite him for dinner anytime. <laughs> I'm sure he was quite fun. <laughs> but uh, that's where I, he thinks the Christmas myth came from. No, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the uh, Scandinavia, heavy winters, mm -hmm. uh, boredom. Right. Yep. Evergreen trees. Yeah. So these trans-dimensional beings, do psychedelics allow you to see them? Is that what's going on? That? I think. Well, yeah. There seems to be like a realm beyond. Where you know, a lot. So many people talk about it. They're mapping the yeah. uh, the other dimension, hypersphere. hypersphere, whatever it is, and they're coming back with consistent stories. You know, like the machine elves and all this other. Yeah. There's a whole group of beings right. that live there. Yeah. You know, I've actually seen the machine elves. They were. Um, trying to talk to me, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. But um, they were kind of weird. They told me that they were the governors of time and that they made sure that no one could pass, break any of the laws of time. Uh, so you couldn't, you couldn't physically go forward in time or physically go backward in time. Uh, they would stop you. Oh, well, so that's like the time police. Yeah, they're like the time police. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, and they uh, uh, it, they would talk, and I couldn't understand what they were saying with my ears, but I could with my mind. It was very strange. All I heard was squeaky sounds, but I could hear intel intelligent dialogue inside my brain. And I found that with uh, with certain organic psychedelics, they seem to have a like a character or a personality. And that they share that same personality with all the people who take them. Yes. It's pretty strange. Well, it's like the DMT when you see that arabesque of all the different colors. And uh, and it's it's arabesque. I mean, that's all you can describe it. And just perfectly brilliant colors. Unbelievable. Yeah, like you, the better than the best painted mirror that has ever existed. No, you got to wonder where that style of art came from. Did it come from the use of psychedelics? I mean... It's quite possible. Well, uh, Yes, there's even a hypothesis that uh, that the use of psychedelics is actually what took humanity into technology and yep. and self awareness. I guess. There's a great book, uh, The Immortality Key. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the author. I know it's Mike, but it's a great book. Just came out. He did an interview with Graham Hancock on Joe Rogan about a year ago. Immediately bought the book, and he says the Catholic liturgy is uh, 
was a psychedelic experience. And he proves it well, pretty heavy that, that that's what it was. And well, that, so they had those special wafers they were giving out? Mm -hmm. Oh, that would be that that'd be a popular church for sure. It was a very popular <laughs> church. And 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 you know, then, then there's some at some point, I know Terrence Pretenna was very interested in this. At some point, it's just either we forgot how to process them or some terrible force came in and outlawed it. Or well, there was the witch burning, so yeah, probably was making them. That's the women right. were probably making it. And then when we got rid of the women witches, though, there's no more, no more good. Uh, that would, they were probably just using fermented uh, barley where they get the same yeah, problem. The bacteria, yeah. the same one that produces. That's LP. the problem. As you go further north yeah. in Europe, it gets harder and harder to find psychedelics of any kind. Well, thank God for that red and white mushroom. Yeah, that's what that's where that came in because that was prevalent in northern forests. It's prevalent here too, by the way, in Colorado. I've seen it out in the forest, walking around, big huge ones. Um, but they're dangerous, so I'm not. Yeah. Oh yeah, and that's why they drink. They put them with the reindeer yeah. first. They don't want to be the first in line. Do not want to eat them. No, that's no, that was very very bad. Uh, Get yourself a reindeer. <laughs> Yeah, the reindeer and Santa Claus. Yep. Well, so, I mean, if you had enough of that, reindeer probably would fly. Yeah. So, in your view, what um, what is what is the ether in your view? Because that is really the question. This is what Constable was seeing with creatures that are in floating through the ether and. All of these other things are all associated with that. And psychedelics perhaps allow you to see into those other worlds. But what do you think the ether is? I think the ether is the superfluidic vacuum. Imagine a vacuum because it has resistance and recessivity. Yeah. And, and so there's something there. It's not a nothing. And like, look at the speed of light. Let's say just like sound as we, we talk here. I mean, what does sound go 500 something miles an hour in air? It yeah. goes like uh, 2000 water, goes 5000 in steel. Yeah. And if you look at electromagnetic radiation, light, it's uh, when, it, when it's going maximum speed in the void out above, well, it's not void, but you know, in the vacuum, as we call it. Right. And then it slows down one or two percent when it hits the atmosphere. When it hits water, it can slow down, I don't know, five to 10 percent. Glass, it goes up to 25 percent. So the wave goes slower, the more, quote, dense the material. So if you really look at it, matter is like a bubble, a rotating cavitational bubble in a superfluidic vacuum. And, and because it, the proton never stops because the vacuum is superfluidic and can't. And then look, look at the electron, right? The, the electron has these neutrinos when a neutron breaks away from a from a electron, proton, and then these neutrinos. But if they study the sun, they, they were supposed to have electron neutrinos, I think, coming from that. And they only have found a third. What they found is the neutrinos tumble. So there's three things in the lepton range. They got the electron, the muon, and the tau. And one is like, one is electron. I think muon's about 300 electron weights and the tau is like 1500 or something. And, but, and so that flips. So if you look at it, the electron is actually all three of those things. And because if the neutrino flowing away from, you know, the reaction in the sun, if it's half of its electron muon, then it's a, that, no, it's electron neutrino. Then it's a muon neutrino. Then it's a tau neutrino. So it's like tumbling. So it's all electron. Yeah, it's just tumbling. And so, uh, yeah, the electron is the muon is the tau and the proton is whatever, you know, certain, uh, certain other, certain baryonic, certain larger baryonic masses. It's right. just, yeah, it's, it's like, it's like a, it's like a hollow mirror. Yes. A hollow mirror. It's a human That's right. The mythical wizards lived in the hall of mirrors because the mirrors allow you to see the invisible beings. Yes. And uh, you have, I think there's a little bit of supporting evidence for these invisible beings being around us all the time, maybe even in the room with you right now. They are definitely in the room with us all the time. And um, uh, they just don't notice you or they don't really care about you. They're just kind of grooving in their own world and uh, sometimes we intrude and meet each other and that's when things get weird. And that's what's uh, going on with the paranormal. And so these, uh, if you go back through history and you look at the, uh, the schools that were going on, you can see that they were, their goal was communication with these invisible beings. That's what their goal was. And to get useful information back from them. So 
Um, it was a communication. Oh, well, some of them demand, you know, animal sacrifice and yeah. other things if they want to get something back from them. Well, yeah, you were saying that uh, uh, what was it? you had to kill a relative to get. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you go back and like, if you, we, in the West and in Asia, things have turned for empires have come, empires gone, but there's things where the pure ancient things still exist. And that's like the Diné, the Navajo people, but they're also the, uh, they're also the Apaches and there's a couple, several other tribes because they came from the North, through North America. Yeah, right through this area. Yeah, so they have, they have, um, they have uh, uh, beings they call skinwalkers yeah. who are, they gain their power by blood sacrifice. Yes, exactly. It has to be a close relative. And that's the same, that's the left-hand path versus the right-hand path. And in the Navajo, I'm not a, and I'm not Diné, so I'm just going to tell you from the outside that yeah. they have the medicine men, the blessing way, yeah. and they learn their herbs and uh, other physical things to heal the people out of set bones, yeah. and also to deal with spiritual afflictions. Right. And most of those spiritual afflictions come from those dudes that fall in the left-hand path, which are the witches, it's called the witching way. And if you're a really good witch and you've done a lot of bad, evil things, you can work your way up to Skinwalker and I hear there's even things above that that you can become, depending on how far you're willing to go. But it's always like making a sacrifice of like a close relative, like somebody you don't really know. Maybe that's, you know, 10 bonus points, but, you know, a close relative could be 10,000 bonus points. Right. So that would explain kind of the generational thing that's going on with these families. Yes, it, it would. So um I was doing research for my latest film, which will be out in about a month, JFKX. And um, I was doing uh, research on the Kennedy family. And I discovered that um, the Kennedys had a sister who was lobotomized by Joe at, at the age of 19. Because she was very sexually promiscuous. Yes. Now think about that. Think about that. Oh, and, and what did she do all those years? She was, I, they didn't even know where she was. Yeah, yeah think, think about, about that. that. Shades yeah. of John. Yeah. Um, same thing with uh, Meyer Lansky, the gangster. His wife uh, one day just was complaining about him. And the next day, she was in a mental institution for the rest of her life. Yeah. Probably lobotomized. Well, that was probably a convenient way for rich and powerful to dispose of uh, <laughs> pesky wives and other people that they yeah. didn't like. Yeah, I know. And so it's quite interesting how um, these, uh, these wealthy people have people that are close to them. They appear to have been sacrificed. Oh, yes. And then, well, didn't the Soviets use that on use lobotomy on class enemies, yeah. especially intellectuals? Yeah. They would lobotomize as kind of, you know, the ultimate punishment. Yeah, that would be scary, wouldn't it? Yeah, so um, I also have another friend, and uh, she tells me that the pharmaceutical companies are starting to run out of uh, drugs. Well, uh, I mean, 90% of pharmaceuticals are made in uh, China or other Asian nations. And that they're replacing them with placebos. Oh, they're just, they're watering it down, you mean? Yeah. It's like they water down the liquor in the yeah. mining towns when it got running low. Right. And that um, they're beginning to be discovered. People are doing blood oh. tests and finding out that the drug they're supposed to be taking is there not really it. in them. And so now the pharmaceutical companies are being pushed into a corner where they're going to, this is what she says, she's a really good researcher. She says they're going to have to publicly declare that these drugs are no longer available. Oh, man, that's going to be brutal just to think, you know, something like, I don't know, 20 percent of urban females are on one sort of uh, and a lot of men, too. Yeah. Man. And on one of those. And when the serotonin uptake inhibitors go away, the brain has a bit of a time readjusting. Could be night of the living dead. Hmm. Yeah. The zombie apocalypse is upon you. Almost. <laughs> Wait a couple months. Uh, so uh, you saw the uh, um, Raxon and I both played that uh, that guy, uh, that doctor in Malibu, mm -hmm. who is videotaping these odd, really fast things, and and some of them might be insects. But uh, what do you? Uh, for one thing, there isn't really very many insects in Southern California. Oh, and and, and so it's, it's yeah, it's, it's he's seeing yeah, some are insects, but some aren't. It's the same with Jose Escamilla, remember? Yeah. With rods, and so you know, sometimes they look like an insect. Sometimes they were something else. And what do you think they are? Well, I'm not sure. You know, they have a, a, one of the things that I saw that uh, he had a bunch of photos. 
from dozens of times as they were in the spaceship show. Yeah. If, if it's an insect with little wings, they say, well, what is an insect flying around in the space shuttle? Unless, of course, the vacuum is a superfluid and it just has a little, it has little electromag electromagnetic wings or electrostatic wings that is flying around in outer space. Part of the space plankton. Remember the pulsing Gosh. things you see out there where they had that antenna, the, yeah. the tether broke and was going like this and all yeah. these creatures were pulsing, came by and were checking it out. But they're translucent. You can see right through them. It's a space shuttle experiment. I believe 95, where they put a cable copper cable out of the space shuttle and let it loose. And it actually gained a bunch of electricity from just being in space. And then all these orbs and spheres started like fish almost flying around. Oh yeah, there was, there was several, there was like the pulsers and there was these weird triangle types. And that. so it was, it, but it looked the most of the things like space planted. But yeah. you know, they've also, well, this is something to think about. On the space station, they put up these aerogels to catch things from, you know, coming in and don't destroy them against the surface. Right. And they find all, when they brought them in and test them, they find ocean plankton. And ocean them. plankton. What? How is ocean plankton ocean getting plankton. into orbit? Yeah. You Unless, of course, there's a spacecraft leaving Earth, dripping a little bit of water. Oops. You know, but, but I would, that would be a conspiratorial, uh, wrong thinking thing to think. No, they found him actually on the surface of the space, uh, Russia space station. Yeah. They found a living organism in outer space in temperatures that are you, you're not supposed to be able to live in, just like the deep hot biosphere. Right? Yes. So Thomas Gold says that there, there's a uh, little organisms that live underground and that's what oil is. Oil is the dead organisms that uh, uh, live underground. Yeah, there's also basalt. As it decays, it releases hydrogen gas as it oxidizes. And there's bacteria that are designed to live off that oxygen, usually with a little bit of sulfur to help it all out. And, and yeah, they live deep in the earth or in some hot springs. Yeah. Just don't take the, uh, the sub down there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we probably should reserve. No, no, I'm sorry. Those people died. Yeah. But they should have built the sub better. Even yes. James Cameron said they shouldn't have used carbon. carbon fiber. Well, the thing it's it's just like it, every time it's flexes. Well, it's like the Russians. No, that's right. The, the Russians, the Russians use titanium in their subs, which is lighter and it's stronger. But every time, like you take it down, every time you go deep, it weakens the titanium until you can't, you know, until perhaps it could just rupture at regular cruising speed, and that's the end of the sub. But with uh, the U.S. uses stainless steel. Which actually, when it gets squeezes, gets harder. Right. So you could go down, you know, five hundred feet. You could probably go down six hundred times because you're kind of annealing the whole sub so, if it's designed well. So all those uh, odd, secret sub, uh, 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 supposedly Soviet sub uh, experiments that went down. You think yeah. that's why because of the titanium. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it would just get weaker over time, and you wouldn't right. know. Just like something that just happened was <laughs> carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is laid down in layers, right? And so those layers, when they're squeezed and perhaps they work against each other. And so they just naturally, over time, just like titanium, they're just going to get weaker and weaker and weaker until at some point of voyage they could make before they could no longer make. Now, is this their first voyage, this uh, Titan? Oh, I think it's actually done lots of voyages. Right. They kind of, they've been using it for a long time. You know, it's got a lot of Band-Aids on it and, well, one Band-Aid too far. Yeah, well, that's, that was quite the thing. Um yeah, so you're telling me earlier, I want, I want you to repeat this story, because again, I want to go back to this interdimensional ether and these sky critters and there's animals that are living in space and all around us that we can't see. And you're telling me about these uh, pilots. That oh, saw yes, yes, that's in Trevor's book, uh, They Live in the Sky and in uh, Cosmic Pulse of Life. Okay, this is, I think it's the 50s, and the, these, these pirates are flying like little of those Piper Cessna, the old type Cubs, and they can land in a very short time. They're kind of like a training plan. Right. But they, it's good because the engine goes out, you can land in a short time. So they were flying along in uh, somewhere out like Navajo land, the desert there, and they saw a, one of those tall mesas that rises up that yeah. you've seen in all the paint, paintings. They yeah, saw like right. this, this, this metallic disc. And so they circled their, uh, they circled their Piper Cub around the, the formation. And finally, you know, they said well, it wasn't moving or doing anything, and they almost looked damaged. And finally, they decided they'd land. So somehow they landed on top of that mesa. And then they all got out and they walked over to this disc. And the disc was, you know, it was like 10 to 15 feet across. And there was like a big hunk taken out of it. And out of that hunk where, you know, the, the flesh is, the metal flesh is, there's like bubbles, oozing bubbles, bubbling metal, like some sort of bubbling metallic substance. Like it was bleeding. Yeah, like it was bleeding. 
And then they're there for like 25, 30 minutes looking at it, saying, wow, this is totally, you know, whatever. They didn't have cameras back then, right? They're just flying their cub because that's what they did. And then this bigger one, you know, maybe 50, 60, 70 feet, who knows how big it was, came down over the other one. And like they, you know, when this happened, they got their ass out because it could be mama. Right. Right. And then three legs came down on the three sides and it pulled it into the core. Remember in the Curia era, they had organisms that were three lobe. Yeah. But anyway, they, they pulled it inside the uh, the larger thing and then it, then the legs went away and everything just went back to like a smooth surface. And then it sat there for like 10, 15 minutes and all of a sudden it gave out a belch of gas, like the worst part you'd ever heard. And the guy's almost like, you know, choked to death because it was the most foul smelling thing they'd ever, ever smelled. It was hideous. And they ran, you know, upwind to get away. But, uh, but and then the thing flew off and disappeared. So, I mean... That's almost like a metallic, one type of metallic life form eating another type of metallic life. And then belching. Yes, and belching a terrible fart, the worst yeah. fart they've ever. Yeah. And they also had, well, there was a thing in, in uh, out in uh, Grand Junction, Colorado. And this guy was out there and he saw this UFO take off. And then he saw this red object fall from it. And, it, and, he, and then he went looking for it and it had fallen into a bush and caught it on fire. That's how he found it because there was smoke. And I actually met him, he was uh, at, at one of some of the conferences. Uh, that uh, they had actually, he still had the thing. And they cut off a, pit, a piece of the edge of it and given it to somebody else, some researcher, you could actually see like the, uh, and it was it was like, you know, a petrified metallic turd, basically. And when you put it in the lockbox, and it was a contact of the desert, when you put it in the lockbox, it would like drain the energy from the lockbox. And so the batteries would go by. So they had to come up twice and physically open up the lockbox because all the energy from the batteries had been drained out of it. And uh, he died in a car wreck like five or six years ago. I don't remember his name. But I actually held the object in my hand. I saw it. You know, it's holding a metallic turd. Okay. <laughs> so they're, they're metal yeah. living beings. Yeah, metal living beings. There's another, besides these, these amorphous, you know, translucent things, we've got these metal living beings. Who knows where they came from? Probably light years away. They spread through the universe or something. So, I mean, just how many different weird stuff is out there? Just layers and layers. Things so weird we can't even think about it. So right, we run into it. So then UFOs could be alive. Yeah, UFOs could be alive, but there's probably a dozen different things that people call UFOs. Right. It's like if we tried to call all planes the same plane. Yeah. No, every plane is, you know, they come in varieties, and just as there's many varieties of planes, there's probably varieties of UFOs from a variety of different sources and places, and it's very complicated, hard for the human mind to grasp. And then what, the aliens? So we think these were made by aliens, or were they, I don't know, how could a... A metal thing evolved naturally. Well, you know, you turn on there and talk about AI. You know, it's, if South were producing AIs, well, what would happen? Might, you know, just be a new ecosystem, right? Where one hey, one South reproducing AI eats a different variety of South reproducing AI. And you now you have now you have a, a you know, you have this insane new AI ecosystem that maybe is already out there. Maybe those little flying things are AIs that, that can soft reproduce and make themselves somebody created like. You know, or maybe they naturally evolve some process. Like, I have no idea. Yeah, that's what that's, I think. Yeah, I mean, and I think I think people probably you know as we as you know we've got jellyfish, right? And you got these things, and maybe other extraterrestrials and some crazy thing would just see these things and then just imitate them, figure out how they work, imitate these you know crazy metallic life forms, and and then they could fly around now. But uh, and hopefully that their craft doesn't get mistaken as one of those ones that gets eaten. You know, probably want to make sure it doesn't look quite like that. It's a so, predatory world. Yeah, that, you, yeah you want to put paint it like red and black so it's, oh, this is a poisonous object full of humans with bad bacteria. Go away. So then there's this guy on um, on YouTube. He's got a, a cha channel. I think it's called the Mars Anomaly or something like that. And what he does is he just looks at uh, uh, pictures that NASA takes. Yeah. Not just of Mars, but everywhere. Oh, yeah. And there's he And he's, he's looked at uh, certain asteroids and he found things on there that look intelligent well isn't there the obelisk on Dobo, uh, um, phobos uh yeah it's a, a monolith it's a monolith yeah it's yeah the monolith yeah and, it, and you could just i mean multiple it may very well be that that um yeah. that they photographed that in cubic shot oh yeah before he made 2001 because the Russia, they actually were sending a Russian yes, probe to Mars, and they, they saw this picture of a stripe. Yeah, that just means an object moving really, really fast. Yeah, because it's for the, the camera, it's moving faster than the camera length as it takes the picture, right? So it's blurred mm -hmm. out, and then uh, maybe it impacted. And that was the end of the, uh, yeah, that was the end of the spacecraft. Ninety four. Yeah, um, that they were trying to take a photo of. Yeah, phobos. they got one photo of the yeah. street, but then then the 
uh, that it ceased transmitting. But now, uh, European Space Agency took a really good picture of Phobos, and um, Hoagland took it and showed that there were these parallel lines running all oh, yeah, the way in the, in the, uh, the, the yeah, like, yeah, like floors. Yeah, in the, in the ancient asteroid. Yeah, and, uh, all, and his contention was that Phobos is a ship. Well, oh, this was where I was going with this because I think a lot of the objects that we think are meteors and asteroids are actually ships. Oh yeah, and, the, and also Phobos has like a big crater in it. Yep. So it looks like the Death Star on Star it, on uh, Star Wars. Well, actually, so does um, Iapetus. Really, yes, Iapetus has that. Iapetus is just like, and it's Iapetus. bubbling off water and other things. It's 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 obviously liquid water just inside that object. And it's got you know phosphorus, sulfur, all those things needed for life. And so, who was that remote viewer said there was actually a yeah. resort, an alien yeah. resort, yeah. Yeah. where people would come, yeah. aliens would come to watch the uh, the ice geysers of uh, uh, Iapetus. Uh, Titan. Titan is it? Where's the ice ga geysers at? Are they? Is it on Iapetus? I yeah, remember. Iapetus is the has the, okay. the geysers. Titan has that nitrogen atmosphere, but it's really really cold. Yeah, and they have they have like lakes of ethane and other weird petroparts. And of course, Iapetus is where um, Bowman meets the monolith in the book oh. two thousand one. Oh, isn't so. that strange? Yeah, well, there goes there. to Saturn, and they go to Iapetus. So, well, there it is. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, well, sometimes things work leak out in fiction. Real, you know, you can't say the you can't say the thing. But I mean, that's like well, we have to do that every day when you're talking about to be uh, stay away from certain subjects. You have to speak in metaphor or yeah. riddles or whatever it is, and and it's the same. Well, anyway, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what I think. I think that the uh, the German secret society called the Brotherhood of Saturn, which uh, Werner von Braun was a member of. Uh, goal was to get back to Saturn. Somehow go to Saturn because they think something is there for them. Well, didn't somebody didn't like or think uh, Reagan was associated with this? Some giant things feeding on the rings of Saturn or something? Uh, there, uh, that was a NASA uh, astronomer. I can't remember his name. Norman Berglund. And he looked at photos that the Voyager had taken of Saturn and saw that there are little vehicles repairing the rings. There were literally, there'd be a gap in the ring where there was no ring, and then you'd see this little vehicle going by, and the ring would be back and repairing it. Oh, well, uh, hmm. That's... And that's a NASA scientist. Yeah. Well, no, they've, they've yeah, they've... Uh, I don't know if he's still alive. He must be like 98 years old now. Yeah, and I heard there was also large objects. Yeah, no, there them. are. Well, well, you think about it, you know, it's, if those, you know, if you're... Because those rings are of water and they're they're yeah. sublimating into space. So if you're like a water drinking creature and you wanted to get a drink of water, or if you were like a traveler between star systems and want to get water, man, there's there's your oasis right there. You don't even have to come into the planet. Just come on by, scoop up your water you need for the deuterium to run your engines or something, and away you go. I don't know what's going on. Yep. Actually. Maybe that's what that is. And they don't even know how it got there. There had to be a moon which disintegrated in the last hundred million years. Was, did the moon disintegrate by nature, or did somebody else make it happen? And why haven't the lines began forming, began morphing into each other? Why are they keeping their distinct, like a photograph record? Oh, yeah. Well, there's been little shepherdy moons. They have this whole complicated thing, but, you know, the very origin of it itself, they say a moon got too close, but, you know, who knows? Anyway, it's it's one of those mysteries. There's so many mysteries out there. And, it could be the yeah, asteroid belt explosion. Too. That's true. That, I mean, there's so, yeah, we know so little of the infinity of the universe well, think i think we know everything sometimes I, what i what, what i think happened is is that the germans uh created their uh secret space program with the americans and they went and sent i don't know if it was manned probably not but sent probes out into the solar system and they took pictures of iapetus saw how weird it was arthur c clark saw those pictures too and also the monolith on Phobos. Yeah, remember in November, it was, it was way back at Norton Air Force Base, and they had that one viewing, and I worked at Norton Air Force Base for a while, so I've been on there driving back and forth. So, right near there. Yeah, and they had this hangar where they did, there was just some special event, and they had like this three like ships. They had all like the SRIs and the other planes on one side, the best of our, and the other side, they had like these three saucer craft all hovering over the floor like a foot, and one of them was half disabled, even though it was still hovering, 
And the one that was all totally battered, that one allegedly went all the way out to Neptune and came back, visited all the big planets. It was like nothing but big oxygen rebreathers. It was like a suicide mission, three guys right. on three different sides. Yeah. So in case it wasn't just two guys, right? One guy dies, you know, you got you got a replacement, but they had three guys. So if two guys die, there's still one alive to keep it. So that they went to the triple reinforcing thing and then they flew it all around and they got back it was all bad and everything but this is the story right yeah and i can't say you know whether it happened and then uh and so that was kind of like one of them still alive yeah, your vip i have no idea they they of course we would not know the names of the pilots of that that would and be what year is this what do you think oh hell that was not late 80s i think and this thing could have been done it you know 15 years before it was yeah. it was brought out and they had you know some of the first models of the the best planes and how did they get them there by the way that secret underground tunnel system. It's yeah. 70 feet wide. You can put all U.S. military equipment and ship it from one side of the country to the other, anywhere in between, and uh, on their underground network of tunnels. Yeah. They, they've spent, that's where that $21 trillion of missing taxpayer money went, some of it, and big cities, too. Oh, um, what's her name? John. Who's the uh, woman who worked for the Department of Interior? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, Catherine Austin Fitz. Yeah, Catherine Austin. When that money was going out the back of HUD in the Defense Department, I mean, Professor Skidmore. And his yeah. students got together and from her, yeah, like, they're standing it out. They're yeah. economics students yeah. and professors. And they, yeah, they have $21 trillion in cost overruns as of, I think, December 2019. Yeah. So, you know, what's happened since then? Who knows? But it's still, that's pretty big. And Professor Skidmore, when they, they passed that FASB 56 in uh, 2000, uh, I think that was 2015, they signed it. And so most of the books went dark. You could still do other. So FASB and his guy, or so uh, Skidmore and his, Group went, then they figured out what's the turnover in treasury rates. And as far as in December of 2019, whatever, it was uh, something like the outstanding treasuries were $95 trillion, not at that time the $25 trillion. And if you look at how it's growing, so actual outstanding US treasuries could be as high as $130 trillion, not the $35 trillion they're telling you, which means our debt to Productivity ratio is four. I used to, I had an economics degree, by the way, back at a bachelor's, and it is four times as big. And I mean, if, if you really knew that the you know the United States debt was four times what it is, and it was a corporation, which maybe it is, I would certainly read D and you know, well, anyway, you know, the US dollar was just a few years ago 90% of world trade. Now it's down to 47%. It's below 50%. That means the US dollar is no longer the world's trading currency. I mean, it's it's just a matter of economic fact. It's not it's not my opinion, it's or or you know, my intention. You know, I'm the messenger. Don't shoot me. Oh. Uh, my my contention is that they think there's going to be a catastrophe and they're just blowing it off. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, like that drunken. Um, yeah, anyway, the drunken sailor thing. Yeah, I mean, we've been saying a lot. That some of this might have to go into like the private channel. Yeah, I don't know. Should we give the population what they well? Just uh, it's just a tiniest sliver of the truth. If there's an infinite pie out there, this is a tiny sliver. Yeah, well, a very tiny sliver. Those we don't talk about certain subjects. We'll that's right. Yes, there are some subjects yeah. which are forbidden. Yes, you know, even though now they're starting to talk about it. Yes, it's kind of interesting how, how things are evolving right now uh, in the world. Mm. It's like, um, it's like the biggest mistake they ever made was shutting down the uh, economy. Oh well, yeah, because everybody went home and got well, got awakened. Yeah, well, you know what? What is Gerald? Yeah, Gerald Salenti says that when people lose everything, then they really lose it. Yep. And if you do that to everyone, you know, well, what percentage of the male population and female population in the United States is ex-veterans? And if the pension funds aren't worth anything, well, they got a whole lot more reinforcements. Yep, that's not a good sign for certain. No, people. they probably put slow to kill on those guys. Yep, just make them all take something happen to them. Yeah, yeah. and then they then they don't. You know, and it saves them lots of money, even pensions. Yeah, they're, they're gone in five years. Who cares? Well, hell, there it is. How much money did they save during the uh, pandemic on uh, Social Security? Oh, huge amounts, especially in Britain. The Brit British were number one, man. They just they gave up that cocktail of whatever. And New York. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, that's and then you could actually sell that. You probably take a security, securitize that and sell it secretly on the markets and make money off of it like two or three different ways. It's just amazing the so, way financial systems work. So Cuomo probably saved New York State like billions. Oh, yeah. But he's and and, and so they, he gets a kickback, I'm sure. Yeah. Everybody gets a kickback. I mean, and where does the profit go? Well, that goes to the big guys. And yeah. so and then he got to retire with all that money. And that's right. Yeah, he did, did he he retire right after that. Oof, he just did. disappeared. Wow. He was actually going, he, they were promoting him as the next big. Democrat superstar. Yeah, it's it well, like very strange. Remember DIA? 
Yeah. They drove this rancher off his land. Then they took it, put it in parcels, and all these politicians sold it, Democrat and Republican. It's, it's a free and Denver large, airport. Yeah, yeah, Denver airport. And they just sold them back and forth. You know, they sold this guy for five. And then it could sell another to 10. And then he sold it to somebody else for 20. And then they all sold up and they all had pieces of property. And then the airport came in there and they got paid huge amounts of money. That's why it cost more than a billion dollars because, you know, a lot of tapes going to come out the back. And so, and all, but there's a, actually, it was true because a whole bunch of politicians. They were involved in that retired immediately. Immediately. Yeah, immediately. That was over. Boom. They were gone. They took All the cash and hello, Costa Rica. Well, what's the his leader? name? The leader of it. He became Clinton's Secretary of Transportation for yes, about it. a year or two. Yeah. And then he vanished. And yeah, exactly. Well, you know, he probably had one a little bit of, you know, oh, maybe you got a good vehicle. If you work for head of transportation, who knows what vehicle you'd be getting? Yeah, at DIA, that's uh that's a scandal if there ever was. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, besides the underground facilities, which do exist, yeah, yeah. but they're pretty much empty. I you know people have gone down there, you yeah. know, maintenance and stuff, and they're they're full of there's basically warehouses full of stuff. And and an entire new uh and there's trains. So. Yeah, exactly. That, that's probably deeper. And then they have uh, and they also have like a another uh, terminal, a totally underground terminal. So if everything got vaporized on the top, they could just scrape the dirt and pop out comes this whole new terminal. So yeah, so the DIA is part of COB, Continuity of Government. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they, again, fearing there's going to be this catastrophe of some kind. Yeah, like probably something, solar. So, yeah, celestial solar. Yeah. I mean, they they found now that they've, you know, the Carrington event, everybody talks about that. They found evidence from the fossil record of something 10,000 times as yeah. bad as the Carrington event. Yes. They don't happen very often, but they do happen. Oh, so if you had something a thousand times the Carrington event happen, which could happen, it's a statistical probability. It might be low, but it could happen. And uh, yeah, you, if you're underground, that's probably a safe place to be. Yeah, I mean, they, there's a, uh, places in Canada where they found ash three feet thick. Um, so there was one hell of a fire. Well, they do have fires in Canada. <laughs> and sometimes they just don't have them by accident. Oops. I'll be honest with you. 15, 20 years ago, I was telling people in Canada about the terrible fires that were going on in California and they laughed at me and said we'll never have that problem yeah uh, and those fires were weird they all started at the same moment oh yeah they had that satellite thing that was on here a couple weeks ago and you just see all these fire dozens of them just going off yeah all at the same time creating the worst pollution in the United eastern United States has ever seen oh yeah I saw those pictures from New York where they have you know the skyscrapers it's just like this this surreal orange like it was on Mars or something Mars dust storm uh -huh. Yeah, so you know that's how they're. Um, that's probably how they're going to flush us out of the country is using fire. Well, you know that's uh, they could try, but I mean, there's so much places burnt down now. It's not going to be you know, burnt most of the land after you burnt most of the land. Well, what can you do? That they have to come up with another plan. Yeah, and, and and you know they don't do controlled burns like they used to. No, they let it build up until it yeah. turns an explosive. Very very destructive. You know, Smokey the Bear is not your friend. No, and they used to. You know, we didn't like it, but they would take whole swaths of the forest and burn it out. Oh, the Americans did that all the yeah. time when they lived here because they would uh, when they would control the land because they burn it out. It burns out the brush, so it makes yeah. it much better for forage for like deer and buffalo and elk. Yeah, you burn it out, it makes it. It's easy to hunt too when they're all. That's right. Yeah, so uh, they had a whole system of burning, just like the Australian Aborigines had. They did. They learned how to manage the land, and to, you know, sometimes to their own advantage. You know, they'll part a grass fire and hurt a bunch of buffalo over a cliff and only cut out the tongues, but you know. Uh, but you know that's, that's the way the world really is. Yeah. So the um, so that the Smokey the Bear then in like the '60s started up the opposite, where you're not supposed to ever have a fire. Well, isn't that the inversion the uh, that they talk about the Sabatini and Frankus, where it invert everything? Anyway, that's probably clear. <laughs> far enough we go. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Probably don't want to bring up Sabatier. Uh, Rabbi Sabatier. We'll just let those sit. Yeah. If you ever want to find out something interesting, look up Rabbi Sabatia and look up his group, the Sabbateans. You will discover an amazing story. Yeah, the third a probably third. can't say it on YouTube. So yes. long. He led a third of he led a third astray, as yes. some might say. He was he thought he, he thought like he was Noah. the Messiah. He thought he was the return mm -hmm. of the Messiah. Yeah. Anyway, and, well, I think we're pushing. Yeah. Yeah. We probably just probably need to stop right there. We'll leave that. We'll let Cliff High take over that. Also, stuff. we're not we're not qualified to uh, <laughs> to make uh, you know make judgments on the literature. No, we don't have the qualifications. We're, we're not we're not uh, religious people. So. No, no, we have to we can't we can't make yeah. those judgments. So, um, with all things going on in the world right now, and you, you keep your eye on the science. What do you mean, like crazy? 
rumors of coups in Russia and you know that crazy anyway which that's yeah that's that's a, the weird I mean just when you think it's like reality has become like the Jerry Springer show every time you think you've seen the weirdest craziest thing that could possibly ever be just wait a week so you think Putin's in trouble no no I think it's like the, the Zorgan they didn't do these like these Fake doesn't plays it, seem, doesn't the, it seem like his organ has a made a deal with NATO? Yeah, but they also make these fake things behind the scenes. So, like the whole Russian political elections are they're actually like a choreographed dance, yeah. like a ballet. They aren't really like an election; they're like a ballet. Yeah. But they do very choreation. So, you know, you may be seeing one thing, but you're just might be seeing the act of some, you know, theater ballet politics or something. I don't know how you call it. Putin is. They should have better music, though. You say Putin is, a, is a, a, just all part of the theater? Oh, they've always, it's been, the theater, it's all been theater since the beginning, you know? Yeah. Who hired Putin? The family, right? And then, yeah. you know, and then whatever, you know, things change over time, but some things don't change over time. It's the, the you know, the, the, what is the song remains the same or, yeah, anyway, there's a whole bunch of, I think, uh, folk rock songs about that whole situation. But, and so the, uh, um, uh, would you say it's a good possibility that we will never know the names the people who are at the top of the pyramid yeah but you know some of them don't have names because they're not human oops so you think that, that the people well, well, come on why, it, look why don't they want humans to know there's extraterrestrials because about two weeks later humans are going to figure out that they've been extraterrestrials bitches since the beginning of time and then they want to revolt so if you can't believe there's extraterrestrials that are your masters <laughs> then obviously you can never revolt duh i mean this is it's very simple you know Keep the cows and the sheep in the in the slot before you know they go into that building. And I mean, why do farmers keep their sheep and their you know the cows? Think it's probably a great idea. They got fence, they're protected. They got water, they got food. You know, sheep yeah. the same way. And then well, till one day comes and oh well, that's just a that's a wake up call, I guess. You so is we're headed? Well, there's a lot of people say that say the same thing that they're culling the herd. They've had uh, there's just too many of them on the planet, and they're using up too much. They're making too much carbon dioxide, and well, you know. 90% I'm going to go. No, sorry, and, that's just the way it is. And um, uh, you think they've thought this through? Uh, actually, they, you know, what do they say? The first thing, you know, that happens in war is, you know, the plans go bad in the first battle. So, yeah, they probably thought it through. They probably had think tanks with, you know, they paid billions of dollars to and they, and well, you know, you know, you know maybe they, you know, maybe it's not working out like planned, you know, maybe the plan that they came up with has gone bad. And then the next plan they make up is makes it even worse. So everything they do is making it worse and worse and worse and driving close to the end to when, you know, the dollar is no longer the world trading currency to when, you know, this, that, and the other thing. It does seem that way. It does seem if it's a conspiracy, it's a pretty fist for No, it's just a conspiracy of incompetence. Yeah. I mean, I think we just, well, anyway, we were just talking about something underwater close to this just earlier, and it's everywhere. It's, it's systemic within the society, yeah. you know, and... Uh, yeah, well, so uh, the societies, when they reach this level of corruption, they collapse always, and foreign armies and things come in to, no, to but, pick up the pieces. But all civilizations have been like this. They have yeah. lifespans. You know, there's a thing when they're youthful, then they grow, you know, they're babies, and then they grow into youth, and then they grow into like mature adulthood and late adulthood, and then, uh, and then, well, and then, then it comes to really old age, and then that final thing at old age where senility and uh the break down the body, and then then they're gone but you know in the meantime other nations have been born or other civilizations have been born just as people come and go but you know we can the species continues so civilization's going to go but you know civilizations continue so uh in your point of view where are we going to be in 20 years uh let's just say the united states well we we would be in the next cycle of civilization but that cycle might be being burst somewhere else on the planet the new civilization rising probably isn't in the like rome didn't the new civilizations didn't rise in the ruins of rome or greece they rose somewhere else you know always obviously moving china, west. yeah obviously china always was, moving west yeah remember china was always the hub of the world yeah. from since the very beginning i mean they do they were pouring thousand pound casts of iron you know a thousand years ago yeah. The West didn't kick out of that. that you know, they're still the world's biggest producers. Yeah. They're just returning to where they were originally, which was the hub of the world, and then where the barbarians. I mean, they made that giant fleet, I think, during the time of Megan. They went all around the world, the Pacific Ocean, and they said there was nothing interesting at all because everything was below us. Of course, uh, 40 years later, the Portuguese turned, because uh, they went back to China, and then they burnt the fleets because, you know, that was just distracting from the great China. Well, 40 years later, you know, the Portuguese came around the corner. And if the Chinese had not abandoned their, their great boat fleets coming you know they had hospitals they had everything 
uh, then the Portuguese would have run into a ship that was a thousand times bigger than there. They had like huge 10,000 people ships. Yeah. Things that, that it's just inconceivable. We didn't have that till aircraft carriers. Yeah, and then they China has that thing where they 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 do they go they get very advanced and then they fall backwards. Well, the same decadence and corruption and competence and evil that besets us now, and, and and but it's just merely the evils of old age taking out you know an aging decrepit civilization. That's right. So that's just, right. it's just part of this nature cycles of nature. And you know, I mean, don't get emotionally don't get emotionally attached to it. It's just this is where you are in the cycles of nature. You know, like, yeah. you know, do mm -hmm. ants really have anything to do with volcanic eruptions? No, it's just, that's happening. Yeah, you lose your teeth when you're seven, and you become an adult when you're uh, 21, you go into puberty when you're 13, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, it's just the cycles of life, yeah. you know, the cycles of civilization. And yeah, yeah and even, even planets will come and live and die. Yeah, Our planet was born, it will live, and, and then eventually our sun will get hotter and hotter and hotter as it heads toward a red giant phase and cook all life off the surface of the planet. I mean, so, you know, basically the thing that life is to do is to like leave the planet and go through the universe. That's the same way as a yeah. as a flower, you know, releasing seeds into the world around it after being pollinated, you know, a, a planet releasing, because we're not, we may not be the first intelligent species. There's even people that claim that during the Silurian period or one of those periods in ancient geologic time, there was a reptile species that actually evolved into technology and left the earth. But because it's been so long ago, we don't have enough evidence to promote that. And so then, you know, so we may not be the first intelligent species to evolve on this planet and, you know, make it are. into space. Well, I mean, the um, the uh, Vedic texts say very clearly that before the sun exploded the last time, they mm -hmm. built giant arcs and they went off world. Oh, yeah. Who are those? You know, uh, who are they? Did they come back? Yeah. Are, are they, they still here? Elites that live here with us somewhere? Or, no, you know, there's those ones that live deep underground, the stories of the, you know, that's a, that's the little people. That's the dwarfs, right? They live underground. And other mythical giant creatures live underground and, and then come to the surface every now and then. Even the Shang Shangri-La, that underground yeah, Shambhala, Shambhala. Shambhala, the underground yeah. something where the king of the world lives. And every now and then they come to the surface to, to deal with our, us mere mortals. Uh, well, yeah, we, we have a short lifespan because we live outside. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. They 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 say they have a lifespan of centuries. Oh, speaking of that, did you hear the story about the guy that lived at the bottom of the ocean for ten years? And they, yes, uh, yeah, lost, that's, uh, twenty years of yeah aging because it's you have a higher oxygen because you've used regular atmosphere. It's a higher oxygen content. Yeah. And the higher oxygen content made like probably mitochondria things more efficient, and it, uh, it uh, uh, the. Israeli study, they put them in the hyperbaric chambers and they did blood tests before they put the people in. So the people went into the hyperbaric chambers for two hours a day, every day for 60 days. I think I got that right. And then they did a blood test again and their telomeres had lengthened. Oh, yeah. I, I'm not a medical doctor. I cannot give medical I, advice. I can't, but, uh, I can't either. But I'm just saying what, what their Israeli tests say. Oh, no, the, the hyperbaric, no, uh, neuropathy. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I'm in a, I have the C60 Purple Power, shopc60.com. Yeah. You can go there visit. Uh, they have, uh, they, they, I've talked like thousands of people, right, about health. Is, and the people, the only thing that people ever found that fixed their neuropathy was hyperbaric chain. No kidding. Yeah, the only thing. And C60 so doesn't do that. Home. That's, yeah, and it's also pressure. Yeah, the pressure, it's pressure and, and all that. So then, and you know, and that's a real med bed that you can go down the street right. and, and well, actually yeah, works. Once it actually works. Yeah, you can get hyperbaric fever. And, uh, and, have, and yeah, I have a hyperbaric fever. Oh, yeah. I have, my other, I have other friends around here and they have, they have two. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, hyperbaric is, if, and you can have it in your house, you know. Yeah. And it's safe. It's, it won't hurt you. It's yeah, the other thing I really found, I had a little bit, bit higher blood pressure and I had one of those infrared things you sit into it's got the panels that right. put the low infrared gone yeah. you can sit in there for 30 minutes you're sweating like and then the, the, all those yeah i mean that's another incredible health benefit yeah so i would say that if you can afford to get a hyperbaric chamber and you can afford to buy the c60 i think <laughs> the combination of those two actually is quite a powerful cocktail i yeah. really do and then there, there's and there's more things being discovered all the time that's uh, and I mean, just read the literature. The pace of scientific discovery is is so rapid now. Oh, it's no, it's, 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 it's beyond exponential. Yeah, exactly. And it's going on, and it's not just science. It's in everything. It's in history. It's in it's like things that we wouldn't even have thought about are now yeah kind of normal. Yeah, exactly. The the, the woo woo things are like yeah boring. 
Yeah. So we're, we're on there onto new horizons that 40 years ago, 30 years ago, we couldn't even imagine. Well, yeah, I mean, we did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we would look at ancient architecture and see it one way. Yeah. Now today, we look at it and see it in a completely different way. So oh, like we said, I've got a few areas. I sometimes I'll call like the cell phone, the magic phone. Because yeah. when I was a kid, we'd see Dick Tracy, uh, you know, things where they had, a, he had his, his phone was on his watch, right? Yeah. And and now it's come, you know, it's to come to be. People do have lots, thousands, millions of people have little phones on their uh, watch phones and and monitors all their health. I mean, the 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 cartoons of the of my youth have become reality. Well, if you really want to um, have a weird experience, uh, read Arthur C. Clarke's book, The City and the Stars. I believe it's 1960. And what Arthur did was he imagined a future a million years from now, okay? And that's what this book is about. And what is that? Well, in this future from a million years from now, envisioned in 1960, are you can create your own shows and everyone can watch them. You can talk to people from thousands of miles away uh, and see them and, and talk to them. Yeah, but it hasn't been a million years. Yeah, that's what I'm pointing out. Uh, every single invention that he envisioned in that book has come to fruition no, already. And then many more we don't even know about. He must have been blown away at the end of his life. Yes, to see all that. You know, he just, but, you know, and they, and they didn't, I don't think, maybe he was a, you know, one of those viewers that can see. Oh, yeah. Well, I remote viewing, but, I, but also it just came out of who he was as an author, you know, and there, there was that, during that, there was that time in the 50s and 60s, they just was a plethora of like science fiction and all the, it was, yeah, and then it went away. It was one of the most amazing yeah cultural times in American history, uh, it, not just the science fiction, the rock and roll was incredible, yep. and the movies were starting to get incredible. Oh, yeah, they were, yes. And, and then it all went away. Yeah, just like and now it's just like... It's like I, is, I saw um, uh, Weinstein, not Brett, the, the, oh, the, yeah. the physicist, what's his name? His brother. Anyway, he's a physicist at Harvard or somewhere. Lex? At, not Lex. Okay. Lex Friedman. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he said something, I think he was on Lex Friedman when he said it. He said, have you noticed that life, that everything in life has lost all of its meaning? And I thought, wow. Well, yeah, but, but right. Yeah, that's right. But you used to really care about a movie when it came out. You used to really care about an album or a book. Uh, and now nobody cares. Well, when a society is going, let's say, to the other side, you know, that disassociation happens. Or but it's not because it's the stuff know. isn't as special as it was. No, it isn't because it's yeah, it's, it's the uh, you know it's part of a historical cycle. And that's what I think. You know, that's when the Westerners have this idea that the world started down here and goes this progressive, right. it goes straight up, and then you know to the infinite you know Jacob's ladder. When actually the older societies like India, and China, and elsewhere, they've seen you know empire come, empire go, civilization come, civilization and cycles. They see everything in cycles, and you're just in part of a cycle. And, and we're about to cycles. learn. We're about to get a real teaching on what that cycle is. Yes, and now, yeah, that'll be a... We're on the downturn of the cycle. Right well, now. We're, we're kind of like the bus has let, gone over the cliff, and, yeah. and it's very... Maybe the front of the bus is even impacting the ground. Yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean... It means the short term is going to be nasty, but I don't know about the long term. Well, it's the same thing after a forest fire goes through, right? Yeah. Then the rains come again, and the sprouts come again. I mean, some fires just have to... Some forests have to burn for the next generation of the trees right. to grow. I mean, and so, and, and yeah, and so it's the same sort of thing, but of course it happens over lifetimes and we are only part of that greater process. So we don't see the real change. Uh, yeah, but you know what? I'm kind of glad I'm watching it. I'm kind of, kind of glad I'm here and I get to see mm -hmm. it. I, You know, um, there's a saying, an Irish saying, May you be alive at the end of the world. Oh, well, there's also the Chinese saying, may you live in interesting times. Right. And that's not a positive saying. No. And we are, uh, you know, and um, and when I was writing uh, my book with Vincent Bridges, A Monument to the End of Time, we kept looking into the eschatological myths of people all over the world. And one thing we kept finding is that... Um, People all over the world thought it was actually a very lucky thing to be alive at the end of the world. Yeah. But there was something wonderful that happens at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, we're about as close to this. <laughs> There's certainly a lot of people on the planet right now. We're about as close to 9 billion. Yeah. 
So anyway, it's been great talking to you, Kelly. Oh, yeah, it's putting out great to visit up here. And, uh, yeah, thanks for coming to Crestone. It's a mosquito-y day today. Yes, course. it is, even in the sunlight. Yeah, well, we have a lot of streams and meandering rivers and stuff. It's been very wet this year. The yeah, rivers are those. Arkansas is just full flowing. A lot of tubers. So is the Rio Grande and um, the Colorado and the San Juan. Well, right. then that dam uh, downstream, Powell and uh, Powell is starting to fill up yep. 52 feet this week. Well, wow, that's pretty good. Yeah. Well, there it is. I guess Vegas can rest easy. Yeah. Lake Mead will keep giving you water. Bugsy Siegel's town is saved again. Well, just in the nick of time. Yeah. All right, folks. Thanks for watching. Hit like and subscribe and all that stuff. And I really appreciate it. And I'll be back.